healthcare analytics. Um, we have a great panel assembled, and I know it's a hot topic for me and for each of these people. Uh, what we're going to do is I'm going to let each of them, uh, I'll introduce them, and uh, they'll each give a brief um, opening remark, and then we'll um, have a discussion with some questions I have, and then we'll open it up to you all. Um, our panelists today are um, Maria Keene, she's chairman for strategic initiatives at the Feinstein Keene Healthcare. Um, Niall Brennan, uh, acting director of the Office of Enterprise Management at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Russ Cucina, medical director of information technology at the University of California, San Francisco School of Medicine. And Nina Proust, program manager for neuroimaging informatics tools and resources clearinghouse. So thanks to each of you, and I'm gonna, we're gonna start down at the end. Great. So I'm Marcia Keene. Um, my firm is a strategy and communications firm devoted exclusively to life sciences and healthcare, and we've been around since the uh, early days of the biotech industry and the disruption that caused. Our clients uh, actually span uh, all the way from the bench to the bedside and back, uh, so it gives us a sense of the entire life sciences and healthcare continuum, and our particular specialty within that, within that continuum is those who are disruptors. We sort of sit at the intersection where disruptive technology and disruptive ideas are gonna change everything. They change public policy, they change public opinion, they change business models, and so on. So we're a kind of microcosm of what's going on in the field, I think, and because we specialize in the disruptors, we tend to see the people at the bleeding edge. So uh, some of my thoughts and observations today will be about what life is like at that bleeding edge, and some of the special characteristics of this field, which are quite different, I believe, from other fields. All right, Niall. Okay, so just a couple of minutes, is that yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, you got four minutes or so, yeah. Okay, uh, sorry uh, for the confusion. Uh, so I'm Niall Brennan, I work at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Um, I am um, responsible for uh, a lot of uh, the analytics and data management at the agency. We eat, sleep, live, and breathe uh, data and analytics. We're uh, probably some of um, the geekier people um, that you'll ever meet, and we're not allowed out very often. I mean, from a from the perspective of you know one of the largest pairs for healthcare in the world, um, data and analytics are key for us. They've also they've always been key for us. We've always generated massive amounts of data. Um, dating back to the very inception of the Medicare and Medicaid programs, but it's um, really assumed a, um, a strategic uh, and operational uh, imperative over the last four or five years as we transition from um, a relatively passive payer of claims to uh, uh, an active um, value-based purchaser of care. Um, providers now have to meet benchmarks, submit quality measures, figure out which patients are aligned or assigned to them. Uh, and sort of in parallel with that, uh, we have the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, which is rolling out um, a slew of programs and demos nationwide. And again, without data, you're just, um, you're flying blind. You can't you can quantify, you can't figure out where your problem areas are, you can't figure out where you're supposed to uh, intervene. Uh, and once you intervene, you need data to figure out um, how you're doing, evaluate your progress, you know, should you, you know, pull the plug in a particular intervention or, or double down because you found the, uh, the magic bullet that uh, decreases healthcare spending and increases um, quality. Um, at the same time that all that's happening, uh, we're sort of confronting the big data revolution too. We've got lots and lots of new information floating, uh, flowing to the agency, um, information from private plans, which we've never had before, uh, information from doctors and hospitals through electronic health records and then non-traditional information that we didn't even realize what we could use until recently, uh, social media data, website hits, um, HIPAA eligibility transactions, um, the, list is, uh, the list is really endless. So um, we, uh, you know, certainly um, uh, embrace um, uh, advanced analytics and the big data revolution or whatever, whatever you want to call it. Um, we live it uh, every single day. Uh, we're pretty excited uh, uh, at the potential it brings. Uh, would add a kind of a, a warning sign that it's not easy. Um, it's difficult. Uh, you need, uh, you, it's not just something that good tools will solve. You need really smart people who know more than just analytics. They need to know the underlying programs. So I guess those are my uh, opening remarks. Thanks, Iris. 
Great. Hi, I'm Russ Cusina with the University of California Health System. We're the academic medical center, the state-sponsored academic medical center for California. We run five of the seven medical schools for 35 million Californians. Uh, as Neil started to make reference to, uh, healthcare is n not unique but notable for the fact that uh, we have not had our data in digital form until very, very recently. The success of the High Tech Act with the meaningful use of electronic health records has spawned the long-awaited revolution in the switch from paper-based uh, healthcare records to digital healthcare records. So really, uh, with reference to the amazing presentation on Google Translate, we are still at that 50 years ago stage where for the first time our data are electronically available and we're just beginning to imagine the possibilities, uh, both obvious and non-obvious, of what can be done with those data. At the local level, I think there's tremendous opportunity for health systems to improve the quality and in particular the value of the care that they deliver. With the Affordable Care Act, uh, hopefully that's going to spur a great deal of price competition, which is what we need as a country in healthcare. And uh, the ability to have and then analyze your data, I think, is going to be a critical uh, competitive feature for uh, health systems as they uh, seek to deliver better value for the dollars that they receive from CMS and from other payers. I think uh, we have an interesting uh, ethical quandary uh, in the United States where uh, let's suppose that a health system uh, makes some wonderful inference about the comparative effectiveness of a particular treatment or a particular model of care. That inference is itself a competitive advantage for that health system, but it's something also of great social value. And so uh, perhaps differently than in other industries, we have to concern ourselves with uh, how do we disseminate those things that have high social value uh, that also may have competitive value for the owners of that information. Despite the fact that the electronic health record uh, programs have been incredibly successful, it would be a mistake to imagine that the data in those systems is interoperable. It's in fact uh, very much not the case, I think in part uh, simply because of the history of electronic health record development and also because the lack of data interoperability across electronic health records represents a barrier to exit for the customers of a commercially based electronic health record. So one of the things we're trying to do at the University of California San Francisco Center for Digital Health Information is develop open platforms that can connect not just electronic health records, but all of the other devices, both uh, medical devices, but also consumer devices, implantable devices, wearable devices, devices in the home, that should be bringing their data into an individual patient's health record and also a systems health record, but for which today there's uh, very little opportunity to do that. To comment briefly on research data, we're also obviously a research institution. Uh, comments were made earlier about the leadership that the NIH has taken in uh, requiring uh, research data that is sponsored by public funds to be made open and available. I think it's uh, fantastic. There's uh, a wonderful provision in uh, the recent budget bill that also uh, mandates open access uh, to the published uh, literature for publicly funded uh, research. I think there's other federal agencies that have lots of uh, very high value data that could be made more available. I think the FDA is an agency that um, has a wonderful opportunity to make the data that it receives from the phar pharmaceutical industry more publicly available uh, for comparative effectiveness research uh, across drugs. Those data are produced through private dollars rather than public dollars, and so the issues there are different but it's ultimately CMS that is paying for north of 50% of those drug costs, and so there's still a lot of public money uh, at play there. And then lastly, uh, there is an explosion of consumer devices that are producing what we might otherwise call medical information. So health care, as big a part of the economy as it is, is still something that people spend very little of their life doing or receiving. If, if you spend half an hour at your doctor every three months, that's a lot. And even if you're very ill, you're only going to be hospitalized a couple times a year. But your health is something that is happening 24 hours a day, seven days a week, whether you're in, in good health or otherwise. So we can't instrument your turbine blades the way General Electric can instrument the turbine blades of, uh, of a jet engine. 
but we're starting to be able to instrument the human body both with implantable devices and wearable devices and other devices in the home. Your refrigerator could know much more about your nutrition than I will ever elicit from you by asking you what you have for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. How do we get those data into uh, electronic health records and other systems? And finally, for 99 bucks, you can now have not your whole genome sequenced, but much of what is known and interesting about your health in your genome. For 99 bucks, you can get that raw data in a couple of weeks through 23andMe and their competitors. If you were to bring that on a USB drive into your doctor's office, your doctor would think that you're a fantastic person and have no idea what to do with those data and nowhere to put it. I mean, literally, the USB drive would sit on their desk probably because we've turned off the USB port on their computer for privacy reasons, <laughs> yes. among others. Uh, so those are uh, opportunities, I think, for commercial and non-commercial innovation in that area, but also uh, important challenges that might seem like we would have solved them by now, but, uh, but honestly, we haven't. Very good. Thanks, Nina. You know, Russ, I left my Zephyr heart monitor at home with my open API that works with multiple apps so I can know what my heart rate zones are, et cetera. I didn't bring it today. As did I. But, but quantified <laughs> self is, is definitely a trend that's going on. Um, and people are very open in sharing that data more than one would uh, assume with the privacy concerns that people address um, on a global scale. Um, the problem is the doctors aren't authorized, like you said, to look at that data, to provide healthcare analysis and consulting on that data. They're not reimbursed for their time to send the email when you sent it via, you know, you know, email as a file. Um, so I think that's an issue that definitely is a challenge in the industry right now that we would like to move towards. Um, I am uh, coming from industry as a project manager of a project. It's called the Neuroimaging Informatics Tools and Resources Clearinghouse. Um, it's a ecosystem of big data images, neuroimaging um, images, et cetera, where neuroscientists throughout the world, funded by NIH, uh, can collaborate and share images, uh, pipeline tools together, share those tools, and pull down pre-process data uh, to share among each other. Um, it's fairly popular. We have just under a million an annual page views. Uh, we've got 230,000 annual visits, 9,000 registered users because people want access to that data that has already been funded and paid for by NIH, and NIH is requiring that data be shared. Um, so it's a way to share that data and get more grants because you shared your data. Um, and 1.8 million uh, downloads for the software and data from the site. Uh, one of the key activities we do is we do outreach at conferences. So I was at a neuroscience conference recently and a professor from George Mason University came to me and she said, big data, huh? I've got all these neuroimages um, you know, that I need to process and what we do at George Mason is we get all the other professors to give us their computers and we cluster them together for the week and we process the data and then we give everyone their computers back. And I said, you gotta be crazy, this is George Mason. Don't you have servers and an IT department? What are you, you know, why are you doing this? And she said, well, you know, you gotta get time in, you know, in the IT department. Some of the people don't know Linux, they don't know the software applications that we want a pipeline to run the data through. So it's just easier to cluster my colleagues' computers together um, and deal with this data in that way. So as an industry, we found that was an opportunity that we could develop a service. Um, we were the first people in Amazon Marketplace to, pro to provide a science-based service where we take all of the open source popular neuroimaging tools and we pipeline them on in a virtual machine and people can upload their data into a virtual machine process and pull it down. So what would have normally taken a week on your computer it takes 20 minutes on Amazon Marketplace, costs you uh, $3. Great, you're done. One of the nice benefits for that is, is that after 20 minutes you realize that maybe one of your algorithms was incorrect. Um, one of the statistical assumptions you made was incorrect. And you can then retune your data, reprocess your data to try and get to a better answer. So we're saving researchers a lot of time where they can go and realize maybe that there's some mistakes before they go ahead and try and publish this data and the results coming from it. So, you know, that's an opportunity out there for industry uh, to start 
providing those type of computational environments. Um, Kendra has written about privacy in the cloud environment. I know it's a topic important to her. Uh, so one of the things you can do is take a, you know, one of those virtual machines, put it on your own machine, and still not have that high barrier of trying to cluster all these you know, pi uh, software applications together and pipeline it. You can just do it. Um, keep your data private. Keep it on your computer, on your, on your university servers, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> why was Nitrix successful is because we were able to merge that intellectual infrastructure with the hardware and software infrastructure. So we had the technologists, we had the people with the applied math, and then we had the neuroscientists all working together. And I do believe that that is still a huge and significant challenge out there with regard to data scientists. Uh, the universities, most of the analytics programs are coming out of the engineering departments. Um, so you have people coming out of an engineering department that understand analytics, they know applied math, maybe they know statistics, um, maybe they know some economics, you know, getting into business and stuff like that, but they don't know neuroscience and they don't know astronomy and they don't need, know geology. And so uh, the universities need to start training that whole new group of data scientists that can cross both. Uh, there was a recent uh, $37 million uh, grant that New York U, uh, University of Ma uh, Washington and Berkeley University uh, got this year where they're collaborating on a curriculum that crosses those boundaries so the people that graduate know a bit of the science as well as you know the computer science or the statistics. I think those programs will be changing in the future at universities and we'll start seeing those data scientists graduating with the kind of skill sets that we need uh, in industry and in the government. Um, right now, if you're a data if you're a data anal analyst graduating, you get like a sixty-seven thousand dollar salary. But if you're a data scientist, you can get a hundred and seventeen thousand dollar salary graduating. So there's a dearth of those resources out there, um, and you know surveys had said that currently um, organizations will say that. 40% of the organizations queried about it said that it's impossible to find the data scientists that they're looking for. Um, you know, 100% say that there is a challenge still finding those type of data scientists. So some challenges, some opportunities. I think the, there were some questions about hackathon and discussion about hackathons and crowdsourcing. Uh, neuroimaging, neuroimaging industry loves hackathons. Um, the data, uh, what is it, the data? Palooza. Data Palooza, thank you now. The Data Palooza last year sponsored a hackathon um, where everyone got in the room, um, shared some data, and came up with some algorithms. OHBM um, has done the same, a similar thing. And I think you'll see a lot more of these type of hackathons and crowdsourcing of data where people will get together and come up with great solutions. Kendra, can I add something? Absolutely. Um, I, uh, I thought you just wanted us to introduce who we were, not. Sorry. Uh, initial thoughts. It's okay. I just wanted to add a couple of things, particularly to what Russ had said. I tend to think that the, uh, the healthcare field in, in going digital is so backward that we're almost leaping directly from the 19th century to the 21st. And I applaud Daniel and the center because I think as a result of that, the policies have not been put in place that are really needed in this field. And I think this field is unique. It's not a, a little bit or maybe or almost unique um, because the implications of going from data to insight, if the insights are not accurate, can be very, very serious at both the individual level and the population health level. Because uh, in particular, if you get information or insights on how effective a drug might be or not be, and you make a decision about that drug as an individual, it may turn out to be the wrong decision. It could kill you or not kill you, and or make you well. At the population level, insurers may say, no, we won't reimburse, or we will reimburse. And the policy uh, framework for guiding who is responsible for the in by insights, who's responsible for the validation of the insights is probably not in place. Um, a couple of specific examples about the pharma industry has started to push their data outward. And there are a couple of um, initiatives. One is Datasphere. One is called the um, Clinical Study Data Request.com portal, which it's not nearly as sexy as Blue Button sounds. Um, and they're pushing out uh, five pharma companies, all their data on the clinical trials for the products that are now on the market. 
It's very carefully controlled. You have to be a researcher to gain access, an honest-to-God researcher. Um, but how do you decide what's appropriate research with that data? Who has the right to access it? For what purpose? For what intended dissemination of the insights? What's the obligation to disseminate or not disseminate? Um, and often those data were not collected in standards-based or interoperable ways. So you really can't maybe responsibly integrate it and smush it. So I would say maybe the lesson from that is that although we are here to talk about health analytics, this is a field where collection and the standards base of how you collect the data is still a very, very big problem. It's an industry that's highly siloed and has not had a great track record in widespread adoption of standards. Um, with respect to inbound data, um, there's a huge opportunity to collect information on the real world effectiveness of drugs um, as opposed to efficacy, which is what you get from a controlled clinical trial. Um, and that is a wonderful opportunity to see how drugs really perform in the real world. Um, but the, drug, the information, the data will come from such a variety of sources, providers, patients, uh, government sources, insurance data, payment data. Um, so the insights could there too lead to erroneous types of decision making. Um, the impact on business models I think is going to be very profound. Um, this is conceivably going to affect the cost of developing pharmaceutical products because if you don't have to follow the gold standard of clinical trials in the future, it's going to change the cost. It may change the reimbursement models. Uh, there may be you can uh, get your drug reimbursed when it comes out of the gate on efficacy data, but maybe over time, if it turns out the outcomes aren't so hot after all, we're going to cut back your reimbursement and the regulatory models. So overall, I think big data on the pharma industry to take that one silo um, could be the meteor that kills off the dinosaurs or could open up a whole new wonderful opportunity for discovery and innovation that can really change patient outcomes. Hey, great, thanks, Marcia. Um, I have a few questions, um, and I thought we'd start with, and several of you talked a little bit about this, but there, there is a vast array of data sources. Um, I know Niall talked about, you know, CMS has used data for years from, you know, from generating claims. Um, a lot of that's still in paper. Uh, some of it has been uh, put into the electronic format. So what, what is the best way to make use of that data? What's the best, what are you all seeing are those best practices for uh, determining what's the most useful, uh, what can be relied on, and then how to, you know, pick and choose how, how useful is social media data and, and how are you putting that together? Well, my uh, first approach to any data is to kick the tires first and, um, and see, uh, see what it tells us. I mean, <clears throat> just to um, maybe um, push back a little on this um, notion that uh, healthcare um, is or was in the, in the dark ages, um, obviously uh, we're um, tremendously committed to um, the success of the high-tech program and very gratified um, at the uh, increased level of adoption uh, by providers, um, points regarding interoperability notwithstanding. Um, um, however, I'm kind of a glass half full guy when it comes to healthcare data, and I think that uh, uh, particularly um, administrative claims and other uh, data sources uh, have been too uh, conveniently written off as, uh, as lacking in value because they um, lack certain clinical characteristics. There are hundreds and thousands of, um, of applications of uh, claims and administrative data that can um, work all across um, the healthcare system from from research to evaluation to patient targeting, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, obviously, um, the, the the tsunami of new data that finally emerges from electronic health records um, will be of a considerable uh, additional uh, value. But, you know, I think one of the problems is, and this is not just a, a CMS or a government problem, I think it applies across the healthcare systems, that we weren't truly leveraging the data that we had uh, in ways that that could help uh, inform care. 
Um, you know, in terms of social media data, again, it, it's kind of hard to say. I mean, I see, I see analyses of social media data. In fact, uh, my my neighbor wrote the uh, 16 and pregnant study that was in the news last week, and so they were analyzing Twitter data, and so that seemed to be like a pretty cool uh, use of that data. Then yesterday, I see a study that debunked um, the Google flu trends results from the last couple of years. With apologies to the gentleman from Google if he's still still in the room. So you know it all really depends. Somebody came in and pitched pitched us on social media analytics um, around healthcare.gov, and you know I'm not sure we needed um, a, a sort of a, a detailed um, research um, uh, analysis to know that on social media people were certainly um, expressing to some dissatisfaction. So, uh, Russ, I don't know. Yeah, I think you, you have to ask the question. You, you've already made the point that you have to ask the question, do you believe the data that you have and, and what does it really represent? Um, I, I ask that question actually about claims data all the time uh, because claims data is an abstraction of what actually happened to the patient and that process of abstraction results in the loss of a lot of information. Um, See, what you're seeing now is a pair-clinician divide that will never be bridged. <laughs> uh, I, I disagree. Um, I disagree uh, because uh, hopefully, uh, again, not to talk about the Affordable Care Act, but uh, hopefully that is going to get the payers and the clinicians into into the kind of alignment that I think both sides want and that the the country as, as a whole needs. But setting that aside, besides the fact that you have to ask, what are the data that I actually have and, and what do they do not represent? Uh, you can either have a goal in mind for what you are trying to accomplish. Are you trying to improve <laughs> the health of your individual patient? Yeah. Are you trying to improve the health of a class of patients like people with diabetes or people who get primary care at your hospital? Or are you trying to improve value across the entire healthcare system of the United States? So I think knowing what you're going for and then trying to be directed about what data you choose to use and how you, how you consume those data I think is, is key. That's not to say, though, that there isn't a, a lot of opportunity for novel discovery. Someone in one of the earlier panels made the point that there's everything that we can imagine we might learn from big data, but there's an even larger universe of things that we have yet to imagine that we might learn from big data. Now that genomic information is inexpensively available to a lot of people, uh, proteonomic information is inexpensively available to a lot of people, I think there's associations with genetics and health and behaviors and diet and lots of other things to health that we have yet to imagine and have yet to discover. And that um, I think having an open mind to what can come out of the data is something that industries outside of healthcare are very much ahead of. The point was made that Google never thought it was going to develop a translate engine until it realized all of the translation information it was already sitting on. I think we're sitting on a lot of healthcare information uh, and there are lots of applications that very creative, smart people from within and outside healthcare uh, can dream up and I think that's very exciting. Yeah, I second uh, what Russ was saying about know what your problem is first before you start looking at the data. What are you trying to solve? Because there's a lot of data out there. Once you know that, then look at what the data is out, out there. Then understand that the data has the quality that you're looking for, whether the meta metadata is there, whether it's been curated, whether it's been cleaned. Um, finding out whether you can do historical um, analysis of the data. Sometimes people give projected and estimated and then actual data and you realize, you know, those numbers changed the next year <laughs> and they changed what they said they projected when you actually try and compare it against um, prior year's data. Uh, so that quality is pretty key there. Um, when you're doing an analysis of uh, emergency room administ you know, admits, you know, was, there, was it a bad flu year this year? Because you know, if it was, wasn't a bad flu year, how do you compare this year's emergency room admit, uh, admits to last year's? So. Did you have any? <laughs> uh, just to add on the research side, again, looking upstream, um, I think more policies are needed because the data are not as available as people think they are. And I heard an interesting presentation recently by a PhD genomicist, world-class, famous, well-published guy, who said for a study he was doing in diabetes, he uh, identified 40 data sets he thought would be relevant. He's got the research credentials and the hoops he had to jump over in order to get these quote-unquote 
publicly available data, it took him nine months in order to jump through those hoops. This is not as easy as people say. So I think we have to be careful about the blithely, yeah, it's there, it isn't always there, including data from NIH, which is theoretically publicly available and still extremely hard to get access to. I think some communities are more open to sharing data than other communities. Um, I think NIH and HHS in general has led the way uh, to make people start realizing that they need to start feeling comfortable sharing that data. They're trying to offer the carrot, not just the stick, uh, so that they will share their data. Um, but clearly, you know, your reputation is based off of your citations. And so you're going to hold on to your data real carefully until you've come up with your research and you've published your paper. And then maybe you'll share if your project officer is really watching and seeing if you are uh, adhering to your data management plan. Uh, so there's a lot of data that's never published that is paid for by the government because uh, it's not shared because nobody published <coughs> off of it. So where's that data? And people should have access to that as well. And to build on Nina's point about at the individual level, the scientist has a, an incentive not to share early or often. At the institutional level, and I think uh, Russ had mentioned this, for example, the Moffitt Cancer Center has collected extraordinarily extensive data on uh, 50,000 cancer patients. And it's an absolute treasure trove of data. But oddly enough, cancer centers compete with one another. Right. So even assuming that the permissions were in place and the data had been consented to be used in a larger setting, what possible motivation would the Moffitt have to share those data with the other 59 cancer centers? Yeah, I, th I think there's, there's a real unanswered policy question there, right? Because part of what we're trying to do as a country is to have there be more price and quality competition in healthcare and have there be more transparency of that competition. And that is to the good if we're going to have privately funded healthcare in the United States. But then it creates incentives just as you described. And do we really want that institution to be sitting on data that would have very high social and health value because it's a competitive differentiator for them? And I don't think we have the answers to that uh, either at a local level but also certainly at a federal level. And it's further complicated by the fact that there's been a societal resistance against a universal health identifier, which is a kind of third rail politically. And yet, if I'm treated, I live in Boston, if I'm treated for 10 years in Boston, all of my records are in Boston, and then I move to Austin and start treatment there, it's going to be very hard to find out when the big data comes out, so to speak, whether I'm the same patient when I left for Austin as I was when I was in Boston, or do I get counted twice? Do my outcomes actually get washed out? Now, some people say, oh, it'll all wash out in the end. We'll fix it on the back end. But I personally don't believe that. Um, so it'll be interesting to see if this is generational, whether it's just the baby boomers who really hated the idea that there would be a universal identifier. Um, perhaps the younger generation will just say, we don't care. Um, but until that policy gets addressed in a candid, meaningful way, I think healthcare analytics are going to suffer. And, and you all covered my policy question very well <laughs> without me even asking. Oh, we barely scratched the surface. <laughs> Uh, we'll come back to that if we have some time. I did want to ask, and this is a very broad question, but each of you have some different backgrounds um, in this area. And, and I'm curious what you all have found, or at least what you would advise, or maybe what that single biggest challenge is um, to putting large-scale data to use. Is, is it um, a technical, is it a policy, is it, what, in what realm, if you had to sort of narrow it down to that one single thing? If we have to pick a single biggest challenge, uh, it would be both the, the fact and the appearance of the privacy concerns. Uh, we could consume the hour, if not the day, talking about health data privacy challenges. Um, health data is really sensitive in a way that other data are less so. And the need for, I mean, don't get me wrong, the, the need for its appropriate protection is critical. Um, it becomes a challenge, however, when an environment becomes so risk averse that the risk of, that the option to do nothing seems like the least risky option. Uh, and that is something that I, I think 
pertains across a lot of areas. I was listening to the exciting work that Nina was describing, and as a clinical informaticist, I find it thrilling, and you would have terrified my chief privacy officer if that person were, were here talking about your distributed network computing on all of this health data. I think those are solvable problems, uh, but it's complicated, and so the clarity of regulation and the clarity of guidance around that needs to be um, needs to be extreme. And I think there's been a lot of progress in that direction. Uh, I think there's more work to be done there. I agree with Ruff. Um, you know, privacy is key, and there's a you sort of hinted at this. There's a cultural aspect to it yeah. and um, the, again this r risk aversion um, when I you know got to CMS first even as a CMS employee I had difficulty accessing data in certain parts of the agency I used to joke that there was a department of hidden data and a department of really hidden data <laughs> um, and you know gradually um, over the past few years I think people have culturally come around to the fact that um, both internally and externally adhering to all the appropriate you know um, privacy and security standards that we have in place that you know there is a, a compelling need um, to uh, to begin to share and use this data more often. I think the second thing I'd add would be, and um, Nina touched on this a little, would is, is the human capital issue. Um, again, um, it, it's not a magic wand. Um, there are not thousands of highly educated data scientists with subject matter expertise in the area you want, whether it's healthcare reform or neuroscience or clinical informatics. And so, um, you know, it is, it's good if you're a, a data scientist, but I think it will be a challenge actually finding uh, minds to, um, to throw at uh, some of these big problems that we have. So I would add something culturally a little bit different, and I think um, one really big challenge that's even larger than the privacy one, although it encompasses that, is that we haven't awakened the sleeping giant of the consumer for healthcare. Um, so consumers sort of play with it with this little app or that little app or the quantified self, but they have not been mobilized. I think the government program, the patient-centered, what does PCORI stand for? Patient Outcomes Centered Research Outcomes Institute. Research Institute, thank you. It's another one that rolls off the tongue, is going to try to change that with the patient-powered research networks in which a patient with a particular disease uh, will have the opportunity and various initiatives to obtain their electronic medical record, load in their own um, outcomes data, and so on. And to the extent that that is truly the pa a patient-powered research network, I think that changes everything um, and overcomes the obstacle that before we didn't really have the patient consumer's blessing to do all this. And the consents were kind of hard to follow and different and sporadic, <coughs> and it was a model. But once you get 300 million Americans somehow participating in an ongoing observational trial of everything, um, I think you overcome culturally a lot of the barriers. Have you guys noticed that it's the boring government guy who's able to finish the uh, the, 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 the random acronyms and <laughs> funnily named data palooses for everybody? <laughs> yeah. Well, I think it's exciting. I had read about a gentleman who uh, was comparing cost and quality data about his hip replacement. You know, he was looking at, um, and I, there was a time where you would never dare to talk to your practitioner about cost. You wouldn't say, well, how much is this going to cost me? And start comparing across uh, providers and considering, you know, going to California or to Mexico for that hip replacement or India. Um, I think that is a huge opportunity moving forward and hopefully will put some great downward pressure on cost as people get access to the cost and care and quality information, start making informed decisions, taking their business elsewhere. Mm -hmm. um, and that's going to just kind of, that's game changer. And I think tying those last two threads together, I mean, the empowered consumer, it's um, amazing to me. And I place myself firmly in this category, how I sometimes check my, my brain and my, you know, rational, you know, critical thinking at the door when I see a doctor and just blindly accept whatever they, <laughs> they're proposing. And then I leave and I'm like, why did I? <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. I want to ask one more question and sort of building on that before we open it up. Um, 
you know, this issue of consumers and patients and, and where they're taking um, ownership of their own data, this is a buzz topic right now. I mean, it's coming up um, in meaningful use and certainly in other areas. Um, so so what, do you, what do you really see from patients? I mean, how, how is this going to work? How do we see giving patients the opportunity to give that information as clinicians and researchers taking it? So if you all can sort of touch on that a bit, and I know Marcia you touched on this, you know, we've got, we, there's sort of an empowerment issue, but then there's also some of the researcher and the clinician issues as well. So I'm looking forward to a marriage. I don't think there's even a dating relationship yet, but I foresee a marriage between what I would call the traditional rigor of scientific inquiry, which is characterized by things like a clinical trials um, done according to gold standards and the massive data collection that we could get to with patients assisting, whether it's through devices they wear or going online and just reporting back and permitting their data to be rolled up into the aggregate. And I think um, I mentioned when I first started I was worried about bad insights leading to very bad deci medical decisions because they weren't validated, they weren't checked, and so on. So. I think we could end up with a system of checks and balances where the power to the people drives the capability for fabulous new insights, innovations, discoveries, but with the marriage there would be the tempered spouse who says, well, let me sub resubject that to the rigors of traditional science. And right now we sort of tend to have one or the other. Um, which is not a great situation. But that's going to call, again, for a policy framework. I, I think it's a really strong argument for the openness of the, of the data, including the very scientifically produced research data, because the, the more people that are looking skeptically at the data, the, more, the greater the likelihood that any flaws in the conclusions that are developed from that data uh, become apparent. We gave two generations of women um, hormone replacement therapy for menopause and only to find out 25, 30 years later that the inferences that were made from that original study proved to be incorrect over time. I think the, the sooner those data become more publicly available, you know, many hands make light work. And I think the more opportunity there are for people to, to find those problems. So that touches on the reproducibility of research uh, topic, which is a hot topic right now. Uh, when you have um, biomedical papers where in 84 journals where only half of those uh, papers identified all the resources necessary to recreate and reproduce the results. Um, I know that HHS, again, is taking the lead on um, expecting reproducibility from um, its researchers and scientists, and um, there's a new offering on PubMed Commons where, you know, people can even actually, if you're a researcher and you're cleared, uh, you can comment on somebody else's research right there online and say, well, you know, I'm not sure about this methodology and why didn't you say, you know, why didn't you give all the information of the data sets or the methodology and, and you know, where, where, are, where is that data so that I can recreate it? So reproducibility is definitely key. Um, and hopefully moving forward, um, people can start taking data and just generating whole new research off of it, right? Instead of um, generating data, publishing your paper, and not sharing it afterwards. And that goes back to the standards again, yeah. and the slowness of adoption of standards in the life sciences. Yeah, the whole issue of consumer empowerment is kind of fascinating to me because it's, you know, the holy grail or one of the holy grails and people have been working on it, you know, so hard for, for so long. I think, you know, when you think back like five or six years ago, everybody was doubling down on, on personal health records and, you know, they kind of bombed and, you know, in retrospect, it makes perfect sense. I mean, who wants to go sit at a computer and type in, I had a physician visit or a lab visit, but as we, you know, several people have mentioned quantified self, so I think there's a couple of things converging. There's the, there's the quantified self movement, which is great, but comes with all the attendant, you know, metadata, data quality issues, um, you know, the person who, you know, religiously quantifies themselves versus the person who quantifies themselves, you know, once a day or once a year. Um, but marrying that data up with, and uh, Marcia mentioned Blue Button, which I don't know how many, how many of you are familiar with it, but it's a way for um, uh, patients to, uh, at least from a Medicare perspective, to download their entire 
claims history for the last three years um, in a, um, a, a machine-readable format. And so now, you know, if a 72-year-old with multiple comorbid conditions, that could be, you know, 300 pages of, uh, of text um, and get very quickly overwhelming, a little like bringing your, uh, your genome to the doctor, just like throwing that stack of papers down and saying, here's what I look like. But um, I think the beauty of it is um, people are, um, and this gets to innovation, people are developing apps that can ingest that data and sort it out for the patient and turn them into an empowered patient and tell them that you don't need to give your doctor the 300 page printout but you do need to tell your doctor these three things like why am on the, uh, why am I on these four drugs you know you know also the do any one doctor has no idea of how many other doctors a patient is seeing unless they're in a highly integrated practice so again um, you know there are several things I think converging that do give me um, a fair degree um, of optimism that uh, consumers you know will become more engaged and that's not even talking about you know uh, you know payment reforms and other you know incentives to kind of um, um, hit the the pocketbook so to speak all right let's open it up to questions um, if you will stand up and speak loudly and then I'll repeat your question yes medical decision making is still going to be in the hands of the medical community and they've come to evidence-based decision making mm -hmm. late in life uh, mm -hmm. the, but now there it's infused with randomized controlled trials rigorous studies prediction and therefore control you're talking about using data in a very different way that they had it mm -hmm. you're talking about monitoring and reacting in some way, for which the guidance is very unclear. Uh, do you think the community is going to shift their mindset, their models, to encompass what you're suggesting? So the question is sort of how, as I, as I get it, how the clinicians and the medical community are going to react and are they going to be able to do all of this with evidence-based um, data, evidence-based medicine with this data, is that right? I think they will, I, and I think it, it's part of what Marsha was referring to. Uh, you know, physicians and, and other healthcare providers are responsive to good evidence, um, and so the quality of the evidence and how it's presented, I think, will be will be key. But I, I think we we know what that looks like now uh, much better than we did several decades ago, and so I, I do think that uh, the change will occur once those data are available. The information that comes out of controlled clinical trials is necessarily very controlled and and in practice what you find it's very very quick that the individual patient in front of you uh, is outside of the data set that is represented by that con controlled clinical trial and so that's part of your job as the physician to make the decisions that you have to make with the person who's in front of you uh, and you don't get to exclude them from the clinical trial because they're sick now and they need help. Uh, that's one of the opportunities I think we get with larger data sets is we're not just talking about the narrowly defined sets of people that enroll in controlled clinical trials and make all the inclusion criteria, but a much broader uh, segment of the population where we can talk about effectiveness rather than just efficacy. Yeah, I would agree with Russ, and I would add that um, I think we're on the cusp of a new generation of clinical decision support software. Um, it's probably not there yet, but soon will be, whereby uh, I go to the doc and say, here are my symptoms, and he says, for the disease I have, and he says, well, look at this, Marsha, and he shows me the computer and says, you look a lot like this red segment among that disease population. You're this age, you have this profile of the disease, you have XYZ gene, and it seems to me that um, the appropriate course of therapy is this targeted um, therapy for the XYZ gene positive people, and uh, we'll move forward with that if you're amenable, Marcia. And that is, I think, once you put those tools in the hands of the physician reliably, um, the things will change also because those same tools will then be available to me at home from the next generation of the patients like me kind of thing. So I can look up and say, oh my God, all the women who look like me in Boston with this disease get the following side effect.
from the drug the doc just gave me, so now I know that's going to happen probably, et cetera, et cetera. So that whole knowledge loop will, I think, fairly soon be available. And um, I also think that we're about to embark on the largest observational trial in the history of mankind, right, as everybody submits data on everything. And that will probably, in our children's um, era, replace the, the gold-plated gold clinical trial, but not yet. That's, that's a generation. And talking about generational issues and Neil's comment that when he goes to the doctor, he has to remember to uh, put back his quantity, you know, his his um, analysis self and bring it in. People are putting their information out there and crowdsourcing their medical information and saying, here's my DNA sequence, here are the, my diagnosis, here are my medical records, tell me what I have. And they're going to complete strangers and crowdsourcing based off of, you know, the data there and getting insights. So, you know, you've got these consumers that are now becoming very empowered, very open with regard to the privacy issue, just want answers, you know, and they're going out there and getting it, whether they're right or not. Right there, Francine, Nick, is that right? Yeah, I, I wanted to ask uh, Nick and Marcia and others, you know, this is really a brave new world. And um, if you think about, uh, for example, what IBM is doing with the kind of Watson style augmentation for oncologists. So they've taken the machine that one would be in, uh, now they're sort of creating a data assistant uh, for oncologists to sort of think about that and make the decisions, et cetera. Um, you know, you can kind of see, you know, things moving out from there. But what I'm wondering about is sort of the issues around policy and regulation. So what if the uh, data enabled assistant, uh, the computer that my, uh, my physician uses, what if it's wrong? And what if my physician is taking good advice? You know, who do I sue? Do I sue my, uh, you know, physician? Do I sue the software developer? Uh, do I sue the, you know, uh, the source of the data? Do I get to sue anyone at all? And, and sort of all of the context, the legal and the policy context around this, um, it just seems to me has the potential to be really great. So let me just repeat it for those who don't hear, and I'll, I'll sort of pare it down just a bit. But there, there is this question of sort of legal and policy liabilities where you've got um, computers and analytics seemingly making decisions, and, and who is, who is who's sort of shouldering that liability, and where do consumers go? I don't think you have to wait for Watson. I mean, the um, places like US Oncology have the pathways. So oncologists are already using these tools which basically walk them, help walk them through what to do with this particular stage of cancer, type of cancer. And those are supported by the medical societies. So I think in terms of who gets sued, um, I think if the physician follows those guidelines that are blessed by the societies, they're probably in a safe harbor. But I'm more concerned about the impact of that on innovation because it, that's the dark side of what I described before, I think, is the positive side that the physician has these tools. The downside is what about the intuitive physician who says, I know the guideline says I should give Marsha drug A, but you know what? There's something about her. I just think she'd do better on something else. And that will, is already totally discouraged. The insurer will not reimburse her, be, the doc, because I'm outside that category of who might benefit, and how do you ever then get to finding out something about my profile and drug B instead of drug A? So at the same time, innovation is at risk. I'm more worried about that than I am about who gets sued. Can, can, I, can I flip the question on its head? So, uh, you know, there's, as has already been said, the straightforward answer to your question is it's the doctor that gets sued because the practice of medicine is a licensed practice and the only people who can get that license are walking, talking human beings. And so that is where the decision lies probably for the foreseeable future. However, uh, the issue be is what is the standard of care? And, and as was pointed out, if the physician has followed the standard of care, if things don't go well, then that is unfortunate and common, but uh, the physician still did all the right things. However, at what point does using the clinical decision support become the standard of care, right? 
So right now, the, that intuitive physician can make an intuitive judgment, or we, we might call it a non-declarative uh, knowledge judgment about what is the best thing for this patient. And today, that's, that's fine, as long as it's reasonable. We're going to cross the threshold at some point where not using decision support and not using big data analytics is going to become below the standard of care. I don't, I don't think we're real close to that in many areas, but uh, it's a question that is coming up increasingly as everyone has electronic health records, just about, and electronic health records come with some degree of clinical decision support, it becomes a question, when does it become the standard of care to provide the kind of automated decision support that those systems can provide? I don't know what the ramifications are gonna be down the road when insurance company A finds out that in rural West Virginia there's a high incidence of cancer and they happen to also know that there's you know coal mining in the area and they just happen to choose not to provide insurance to that area uh, the state because of one reason or another you know what where are we protected there I'm not a lawyer so I'm not going to tell you who to sue <laughs> <laughs> So I think we have time for one more question. I know we're running up on our time. And I think you had your hand up. Is that right? <laughs> All right. Does anybody else have? Um, so changes in data generally bring about changes in the way that we actually present the data. So I'm just wondering if you see, what trends do you see um, in reporting and analytics for handling big data, especially within healthcare? Uh, well, I mean, I can try and take the first crack at this. Um, health data, as others have said, it's inherently big, whether you talk about the 300 billion records that currently like sit in, you know, our data warehouses or the trillions of data points that may avail eventually be generated from, from EHRs. So I think the first, you know, there's sort of, you know, cardinal rules of, of analytics. So the first one is, you know, don't suck or, you know, try and be right. Um, and this, the second one for me is don't overwhelm. So, um, you know, um, and it depends on your on your audience, but I don't care if your audience is an administrator of CMS or a, or a busy doctor, again, sort of, you know, giving them pages and pages of numbers doesn't help them. Um, and this is where, you know, there have been very real advances in data visualization and different things like that, but sort of, you know, distilling down to, um, you know, exactly what do you want, what outcome or result or important thing do you want to communicate to that person? I call it right data, right person, right time, right format. Um, so it could be a simple chart that I can show to the administrator and the secretary saying, hey, look, readmissions are going down. You know, that seems like a pretty good thing that's happening. You know, is it related to ACA? Is it related to something else? We'll try and find that out for you. Um, you know, or a way of in a, in a second or a snapshot illustrating the geographic variation in some aspect of cost or quality in the country, whether that's a national viewpoint or drilling into zip codes in Chicago. So um, for me, that's what it really um, boils down to, knowing um, your audience um, being parsimonious um, and, and, be, and being right. Yeah, I think, um now, having talked about the the population level, I think at, at the at the individual clinician level and, and patient level, it's a yet another place where the industry is just way way behind. Um, particularly for, you know, again, the busy practicing clinician is not a data scientist, and we don't want six hundred thousand doctors in America to have to become data scientists. So, I think there's a lot of opportunity there, and it's um, not something that the incumbent electronic health record vendors, not to demonize them by any stretch of the imagination, but it's not something that they've been focused on, uh, in part because they're having to spend all their time and energy on meaningful use and implementations, which is all to the good, but it means that some of these things that look like luxuries rather than necessities uh, are being currently underinvested in. It's also another argument for the interoperability of the data and standards and maybe even expectations for the interoperability of data that are in electronic health records so that outside innovators can look into those electronic health records and do creative things in this area, among others. I mean, if the first thing that your electronic health record does is give you 23 alerts, 
mm-hmm. pretty quickly you're just going to start going dismiss, 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 mm-hmm. dismiss all, you know, and then the whole function of uh, of alerts is is wasted. Yeah, it the the so the data on that is 95%. <laughs> yeah, across the country, 95% of drug dose alerts across the country are dismissed by yeah. the physician. I think so. we're right at our time. I hate to cut everybody off. I know for me, this has been a very exciting conversation. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.